I'll talk about how you can set HDRs up in Blender and also bake something out once you have something you kind of like. So the first thing I would do is switch to Cycles Render, which is Blender's fancier ray tracing goodness. It's good to have your CUDA setup all set. There's CUDA. Well, that's going to make it render a little faster. And then in the render panel, we're also going to change this to GPU compute. And if you hit Shift Z, you'll notice that you can go to rendered mode. And now we need to actually have an HDR set up here. So I'm going to pull this up to create a secondary panel. You can do that with these little tabs here. And I'm going to switch this to the node editor with Shift F3. You can also do it the lame way and click this little panel. I was tutoring some people on a Mac, and like it's, you have to turn everything off on a Mac to use Blender. Yeah. Uh, you know, I use a Mac. Yeah. And you know what I tell everyone who uses a Mac to do? Turn off all your F keys. Go get a regular keyboard and a regular mouse. And have yeah. Spot. And like they don't, they don't make Mac keyboards with number pads anymore. No, Mac keyboards are useless. Yeah. Really. And they always want to do some oh, whatever. We're talking about Blender. Don't be anti them, be pro you. That's what I say. So in the node editor, I'm switching to the world panel from the materials panel. And you can also do this via the world panel and clicking all these things. But it's much cooler to do it in the nodes. So I will hit Shift A, which is the add menu, and I'm going to add in a texture input, which is going to be an environment texture. And I will link these together. Now when I hit open, I'm going to go to a folder that I just downloaded. Uh, it's in the downloads folder, basketball court. And I think we want this, the .hdr 2k. And if you're curious where I got these, uh, it's always great to go to HDR Labs. It's kind of a place that not only will you learn a lot about HDR, but if you go to Smart IBL, they have a number of setups that they just put out for free and you can download. This is actually designed for their Maya plugin in which, uh, just to show you what's inside of these folders, this basketball court, it's the Maya plugin recognizes a couple of things and it uses this JPEG gigantic plate for the background. The HDR uh, that's way too big to do your lighting with, but it still has all the HDR data. It uses that for the reflections on objects, and then it uses this tiny little environment light. If I can get the file size. So you'll notice this is really, really small. It's only like a hundred and it's only like 360 by 180 pixels. So it's a very small image size, but it has all the lighting data. And it has like one pixel that represents the sun. So this is what you end up using to cast shadows. Somebody's got a weird mouse set up on this. So I'm going to quickly add a plane, scale it up, delete the default cube, add a default cube. And now we can see that this HDR image is actually generating shadows. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. So which one did you plug into the node? Which one did you actually grab? Uh, the environment texture, and I'm actually using the 3K one because uh, Blender actually doesn't have an ability to separate out what's doing what um, quite as well. So if I, like I in my personal render tests, if you're using the 3K to generate your uh, reflection maps, it has no ability to say, we'll turn off all the data while we're doing our uh, shadows. So it doesn't chop it up as separately as Maya does. Um, so I just always use the big one. Uh, they do have a Blender plugin for Smart IBL, though. Uh, it, it works okay. And a lot of that stuff ends up server side too. Okay, so let's say we have this, and let's just make a peaceful mountain scene. Let's call them, uh, oh, that's topology.
Here's our mountain. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're so beautiful, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Whoever like changed the uh, camera, or the viewport nav setup to be like dolly style. Or the trackball track stuff, like you basically, like ball? I can go like this. Yeah. Uh, basically off the default. Does anybody know anybody that uses that? I exclusively use trackball. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. can't stand the other one. Really? Yeah. yeah, because I get. Yeah, like I, I keep going oh, sideways. Now right. I don't know what I'm doing. Well, the yeah. thing is that we have the snapping like in Zoom so you can always just hold, uh, yeah. I'll always snap it back to where it should be. So I'm just used to doing that, and it's never a problem. But when I get under my models and then my rotation is different. I hate that. And with trackball, it's consistent. It, it's a little wonky at first, but it's consistent no matter how you're looking at the model. And that's why I like it. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to do one extra thing here, which is you somewhere around here. <laughs> We're going to add a second sun. Because that's something you might want to do when you're modifying your HDR to have different stuff. So we'll make this an emit material. I'm not cool, so I'm just doing it through the materials panel instead of the nodes. <laughs> and you know, you can see that it barely affects this compared to the sun, but we can see it over there. Right? Maybe maybe it shouldn't be in front of the trees. Yeah. And let's actually make it like, I don't know, a green dot. It's more of like a camera error than anything. But whatever, it's something we can care about. Uh, the next thing we have to do is actually change our camera settings. So uh, I think when I say bake an HDR out, I actually mean it's going to be a render, because a bake is just a render onto a mesh. And so we're actually just going to render from this camera. So I'm going to uh, clear out its stuff, move up. Go to X90, and in the camera settings, this is the thing that you might be missing. Uh, there's a button to switch it to panoramic, and it's not going to look like it here. But if I hit render on this, it should render panoramic image. Oh, we're going to want to change this to be. Exactly like one by one. Maybe? I don't think this is working. That's not panel. Oscar, did you request it? What is it? Do you know how to use the Unity Camera Plus? Uh, no, that's like, um, the reason I would avoid that is number one, if you can get it working, which apparently I can't. Uh, maybe that's what I mean. Equal rectangular. I'll switch this to like zero samples to begin with. Actually, I can go to render settings and put this at 10%. Yeah, it's not I'm crashing. <coughs> so this should Yeah, that worked. <laughs> So some are in the equirectangular settings. Actually, you know what? It might be working. It's just like uh, it's had something else cool, like an arch. Uh, 
That way we can see if it goes across the sky. Okay, it is working. It's just, uh, it doesn't look like it because so much of the horizon gets smashed down here that uh, we don't see the, uh, the mountains as extensively. But this is, in theory, rendering out uh, a 360-degree panorama that you can use somewhere. Yay. And what was the setting you finally landed on for that? Uh, it is equirectangular. Uh, the thing that was bugging me was actually just that. Because um, you couldn't really see what you were I, I was about. shocked at how much of this got squashed into the horizon. Yeah. So if I do something like that, <laughs> maybe that'll go. change it. Yeah, so yeah. now we can really see. Now it looks like, you know, super mountain. <laughs> so my settings were correct. It is just you go into the camera and change it to equal rectangular. And by the way, the camera settings in Blender can do a lot of cool stuff. It's pretty easy to set it up for, like, um, uh, VR. Uh, not that I know how, but <laughs> I know it can be done. It's one of those things where use the Internet as your secondary memory. So now we have to render this out in a way that is not going to look stupid. So usually we want this to be, I can just change it back up to full. Uh, and you might want to go into sampling and up your samples. So this is something that matters a lot. You can set it to like 800. And I think the last thing that you're going to change is your render format. So you want to render this to an HDR format, such as Radiance HDR or OpenEXR. Uh, it's probably, in my experience, bad to uh, convert from HDR, which is this file format. So this is a basketball court.hdr uh, to an EXR, primarily because I, I'm I can't guarantee this, but I would expect you have a little bit of Xerox effect, where if you render an HDR to an EXR and an EXR to an HDR, mm. back and forth and back and forth, they store data differently, so I think eventually it would cause some problems. Uh, so we can render it to an HDR. And this is going to make it have many more bits and store all that pixel information. So let's see if we can double check this image really fast just to look at our basketball court.hdr it's always good to adjust uh, your pictures in uh, your HDRs to double check that they were rendered correctly and Blender's viewport is actually the best um, previewer out there um, so if you have this image loaded in the image panel you can turn on view as render and now I can crank the exposure down and we can see here that this is not a perfect EXR, right? Uh, you know, the sun is starting to get gray while everything else. Uh, but if you pick on the values, you can see that there's HDR values in there, um, in the sense that it's not just one, zero to one. So now, if I render this, let's see what comes out. It's taking too long. Let's do it at 25%. But so, in theory, this is rendering to a HDR, which is going to store that HDR data. For those of you who are new to the world of HDR, it stands for High Dynamic Range, and each of those words means something different. Uh, range is uh, the variation between the darkest dark to the lightest light in a picture, right? Um, and uh, having a high range means that you're accurately representing light. So uh, in a printed out photo, uh, the lightest light you can have is the white of the paper, and the darkest dark is the blackest ink. But, you know, you walk around outside, and we know that there's values far beyond that. You have the light of the sun, which is enormous, and you have the light of uh, a lamppost. And so if we took this light outside, you wouldn't even be able to see that glow because 
uh, it would fall somewhere in the range of the darkest dark outside and the highest highest light, which is the sun. So it would just get clamped into that data. Uh, and how do you make a format that represents something far greater than white paper and black ink? And that's where HDR is really fun. Ooh, buddy. So the dynamic part of it is the idea that you haven't killed that range. Uh, like when I was showing you this folder or this file, we can dynamically change it uh, using the exposure settings here. So the fact that we have something that's similar to an exposure, like a literal physical camera, uh, where we can shoot this with very, very low exposure, and only the faintest impression of this comes in, or a high exposure, and we have more and more data. Uh, a JPEG throws so much of this range away, and it kind of locks you in. So hopefully this... Oh, I changed the exposure mid. So I actually might be blocking the brightest part of the sun, but uh, we can see if you look at those pixel values, they're above one. And that means that it's kind of a high dynamic range. And this is how you can add mountains and stuff, or bridge arches. You kind of want to be careful with it because uh, in theory, your objects should just come from your level, unless they are far enough away that uh, they're visible, but you're never going to visit them. So like distant skylines, cityscapes, uh, spaceship crap, that's good to stick in here. Uh, but yeah, you can start with a photo and add in extra stars. Does that cover kind of what you, you're caring about? So then, in Blender, after that, you would say image, save as. And you would want to make sure that you're saving this as a radiance. And, yeah. and let's double check that now that this is rendered. Uh, if you're rendering it to an HDR, it should automatically do that. I mean, when you apply it as a light in your scene. Uh, I'm trying to think of that question. I think also, when you import it, yeah, it just like in the render settings in Maya, you can see it. Oh, yeah, like it'll try and be 16 bit. Uh, Blender is. Blender has some good people that really, really get angry about this stuff, and so there's been a lot of good development. So it generally is assuming you're using. Um, an HDR pipeline first, um, and you know Maya's kind of, you know, slowly had features stapled on. So a lot of those times you have to go. It also differs based on what render you're using. So I would I haven't used Arnold yet, but that's kind of the future of Maya rendering. And I expect that nowadays, uh, like, I'm I'm betting my first experience with Arnold when I learn it is going to be, oh, I hate Mental Ray even more. And Yeah. Mental Ray now that 3D is doing it directly is better. Oh really? The future of Maya's D Ray. It's not. Oh it's really? Yeah. Or I Ray or. Or Render Man. Render Man or pretty much anybody other than Arnold. <laughs> really? So they did the uh, the classic Autodesk thing of buying it and then letting it die. Well, I think Nvidia got pissed at how much Mental Ray was being handled, but now you have to. Ah, I was pissed at that too. I was always assuming it was their fault. But. It basically works sort of like Cycles does, where it just gives you port fades in and out. No? Oh, good. Cool. Yeah, they know. They got layered yeah. stuff now. Downside of it is, unless you own it, you can only render single frames. Yeah. Harsh. Yeah. And that's true of Arnold, too. It's just that same thing. Uh, what? I was going to show another thing, which is I just wanted to. Because I was talking to somebody about this yesterday, um, but I really like curves in Blender, uh, and I wanted to show you some of the cool things with curves. If you're using the Add menu, 
you can go add curve Bezier. And the difference between uh, a curve in and a mesh is that I think like right off the bat you should jump into the curve menu and start modifying its settings because it's not like the polygons are right there. But the curve menu has a lot of cool things. You can just extrude it. Uh, you can change its preview amount. So this is two Bezier handles and you can choose how much it's interpolating between those. And instead of having this extrude, you can add a different curve and model this. To be an interesting shape, perhaps. And now on this curve, I can actually set that as my bevel object. Right, let's do that. Uh, what I really like about Blender's curves is that it does the thing Blender often strives to do, which is to make each part of its interface feel like a different part of its interface. So E for extrude is just like in the modeling panel. R for rotate, G for grab, so on and so forth. And uh, Two hotkeys that are really useful are uh, Alt S, which is just like in modeling. So if I have a model to compare this with, Alt S is the skinny fat tool. It just scales things along their individual normals. And uh, similarly, Alt S in curves lets you scale things in an interesting way. And the other hotkey for modeling with curves, because I mean I actually use these for modeling all the time, is Control T, which lets you rotate it in space. You can up the previews on that. Okay. So you can very quickly get things like um, sort of Rococo wood cuts and furniture legs and stuff like that. But it's also a really powerful modeling tool in terms of just distributing stuff. So I'm going to add a, uh, I'll show you a couple of examples. Let's say you wanted to have something like a repeating fence. Uh, you could model each individual fence post, but with curves you can <coughs> actually get a setup that uh, gets these along really fast. So I'm going to make a single fence post like that. Z1, so there's our first fence post, right? And I'll actually add a Bezier curve to represent like you know, barbed wire or phone poles or phone cords or something, right? <coughs> the first thing that I really care about with this is that my curve is right there, so I'm going to snap cursor to uh, selection to cursor. I can move it up. Selection to cursor. If you change the Bezier type, you can change it to auto. Let's actually be mathematically precise here. Uh, G X, you know, five. This fence will go every five units. All right. There's my barbed wire fence, right? extrude this a little bit. So now we need another curve to represent this winding, wefting barbed wire fence going along in space. I'm going to snap this one to the cursor. Right. Cursor to center. Selection to cursor. 
curve is done. Let's try ignore. Selection to cursor. And then this one. We're going to do a top view. And I'm just going to make some sort of interesting fence line. Right? And this goes like that. This is a not in a very effective layout for keeping your cows in a pen, but it uh, kind of highlights the interesting use of this. I'm going to convert this curve to a mesh. Alt C mesh from curve text. I'm going to join these two together. So now this is a single mesh object. So now I'm going to start parenting these along the curve in interesting ways. Uh, the parent menu in Blender has like a shortcut to do this manually, uh, which is Control P object curve deform. And you'll notice that it's starting to deform along that curve. And this did a couple of things. First off, uh, you'll note that it actually parented this to that object. And second off, it added a curve modifier with that curve set up. So if you wanted to do this the hard way, you could do that. A lot of times people get really frustrated, uh, or I get frustrated, because I'm using this shortcut and I forget that I've parented it, so I have to unparent it. So the next thing we're going to do is add an array modifier. And if you don't know the Blender array modifier, it's awesome. It just makes things duplicate X amount of time. So we're going to switch it from fixed count to fit curve. And I will select that same parent curve as a curve object. And I'm going to move this up one. And hey, look at that. I have a fence pose. Uh, you'll notice that these are not necessarily hanging exactly. Uh, but you could probably fix that by. Um, yeah. However, yeah, probably um, reducing the preview length. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, when you're doing your conversion from curves to polys, do yeah. you any options for that? Uh, like in terms of. Just like quads for the prompt? I think it does it quads for. Uh, it depends on um, what you have. Actually, like one of the things that. Blender users, the first thing they get upset about in uh, Maya, I remember the opposite being true when I first learned Blender, because I was using Maya, and then all of a sudden they didn't have this. In Blender, you can have a single vertex. Right. And uh, so I think, let's see. Yeah, it looks like if you're using extrude, it makes it quads. So this was not using. Uh, what Oh, when yeah, that would probably be quads, I think. So I have one. Necessarily get any control over how it stacks them for what it's doing. It's going to do the same polygons per length of it, I think. So if I have, yeah, if I have something like this. Yeah. Um. I think yeah, your your spans here is going to matter a lot. Um, so that would be something where before you collapse it, you're going to care a lot about this preview for the resolution. So if I select that. Uh, and I think it, it goes both ways. Um, it's going to matter both in terms of the preview on <coughs> this curve. And the previews on your bevel curve. So if I do that, Alt C for convert. Yeah, makes it. It uses extrusion sensibilities. But part of what's so awesome about the way that you set up the fence here is, if you was to scale the fence down. Like just grab the one yeah. piece and scale it down. Uh, do it, do it in object mode. Oh yeah. Should work in object mode. Oh no, maybe not. Oh yeah, there you go. It's like it's 
fully dynamic. And yeah, but you can also, if you scale it in edit mode, it's just gonna change it like that. Yeah. The reason it wasn't working before was that because it wasn't, we, we no longer had frozen transforms. So you, if you could do it in two steps, scale it down, and then just apply the transform. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a way that, yeah. uh, so another example of how I use this a lot is um, a lot of character stuff actually. You can just have like a mesh, it's, uh, something like, too much stuff on the screen now. So let's say I have a mesh that, like, I just want something that's an interesting looking, cool component for Uh, I don't know. Like a bracelet or something. I can now add a Bezier circle. And I'll have this be something that is like wrapping around a wrist or a neck or something. And same thing. Add modifier. Array, fit curve, the curve I want is that one, and I want a little bit of offset so that you can see the space in between them, and then curve deform, oh. <laughs> Z, but so now I can actually take this curve and also do things like, I don't know, I can't. Yeah, it's interesting seeing like <coughs> uh, where you can do what. Um, you scale the curve itself? Is that, is that so what happens is this curve has a starting point. Uh, you know, Bezier's have to have an idea of their start and their end, so it knows which ways to go. So I can't necessarily Alt S on this one, but I can grab these ones and do stuff to make it more interesting. And I can also start twisting it. So very, very fast you can get like a really cool organic shape. Is that a bevel so that the computer crashes? <laughs> well you'll learn the hard way in Blender is that unlike Maya where it's like, whoa, you're gonna give out the smooth the thing that has like a million faces, that's going to be a mistake. Are you sure? Blender will never ask you if you're sure. It's like, it assumes you want to do it whether it's retarded or not. And, yeah. and then it just crashes. There's no error messages or anything. It's just gone. It's not crashing because of a bug. It's crashing because like you ran out of RAM or something. Yeah. Um, what is it? A lot of, like a great thing that you can do in Blender is a lot of, uh, you're not here, but... Yeah, you can hit control on things and go through them. And what sucks is when you have a uh, subdivision and you accidentally do that on this. Yeah. Very quickly you accidentally turn it to yeah. a thousand. Oh, I, I taught a high school class on 3D modeling and they had lost the Maya package and just probably why I was there. I was like, oh sweet, I can teach a blender. And I show up and I'm talking to them about subdivision surfaces and I told them like the very first thing I told them about is like don't crank that number up past three. Mm -hmm. And then so like five immediately like five students computers stopped working. I'm like, huh, I wonder what they did. I'm like, why did you type in the box? Because sixteen. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, back in the day I remember um it was it was always like a challenge to like see who could crash programs fastest. And for some reason, uh, you know, um, 3ds Max had uh, a pyramid object, and if you tried to bevel it, if you tried to bevel the top vertex of it, it would crash. What the Blender's just not doing it. Did you merge him? I did. Oh, it's Control Shift V, I think, to bevel vertex. Now. Wow. Yeah, the New things to learn. 
Yeah, but I think because there's a difference between beveling vertices and beveling edges, and sometimes you want one or yeah. the other. So I hope this is interesting fodder for how you can maybe do things like, you know, tree lines, uh, fence posts, phone poles, uh, a lot of stuff like this. You can actually use this for roads, and uh, there's a really really cool shot of um, the in-house software that they used for Final Fantasy 15, where they're just using this giant curve to place uh, a multi-lane road, the fence posts along it. Um, and basically everything you need for a road. And you can kind of do that in here. So like, uh, I think actually if I uh, wanted to make a road, I could just create delete some of this other stuff. So let's say I have just a flat plane. And there's a road texture on that. Array fit curve, that, and that, that, control P, curve to form, so there's my road. Now let's say I have a mile post every, or you know, a, a yard post every 10 feet or so. That kind of looks like it. Yeah, I could actually. <laughs> but like, let's say you want to have like a mile sign every ten of these, so you can have different uh, distances for each one, or like you can have different relative offsets. Uh, and now you go into edit mode here. Can you turn on the, um, the the viewing the curve in edit mode? Should be able to in the mod post. Oh uh, yeah. One more. One more. There you go. There. Look at that. Ridge racer. And then you always have to put the wave modifier on everything where you go. Oh yeah. <coughs> this is my favorite thing. Every wave single modifier? Time, every single time I finish a model, I turn on the wave modifier. <laughs> this is my little like, congratulations. <laughs> Split, uh, Split, oh, here we go. Perfect. <laughs> oh That's yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you uh, after that, what you want to do is add a, um, uh, what is it? Minecraft. Oh, Remesh. Um. Remesh. And switch it from sharp to blocks. And don't. This guy's confused. Then you have a Minecraft road. Very exciting. Uh, is that it? Anything else? Happy Blender Club, everybody. Thanks, Austin.